We're just waiting to get the recording started. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, we do have um, everyone joining us here as we are getting started, and I would just want to make the reminder that if you are on your phone, if you can please make sure that you have muted your phone um, so that we are able to have a clear connection and be able to hear the presenters this afternoon. Um, or if you are on your computer, please turn down the volume of your speakers and microphones. Um, my name is Mary Beth Shudwuski, and I'm very happy to be here with you today from Advocates for Youth. I am the Program Manager for the School Health Equity Project, and with me is the person that you all know, Tom LLC from Vermont's Agency of Education. So Tom, if you can say hi to everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad you could be here. Um, we have been working rather closely the last few weeks to bring this information to you, so hopefully it will be helpful. Uh, just to give you a little background on Advocates for Youth, um, we're located in Washington, D.C., and we're a national organization where our focus is on um, ensuring that young people have access to the information and the care that they need in order to make um, healthy, informed decisions in regards to their sexuality. Um, just like um, the Vermont Agency of Education, Advocates for Youth is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Division of Adolescent School Health, and we are funded through a cooperative agreement that is supporting um, getting information to young people around exemplary sexual health education. So we're the national organization helping states do this work, and we're very pleased to be working with um, Tom at Vermont. Um, as I mentioned, we are funded through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and we do always need to state that the contents of this information um, is made possible by them, but it does not necessarily represent the official views of the center. Um, so as we move to get forward, moving forward, um, hopefully after uh, participating today, uh, you will be able to apply Vermont law to support curriculum framework development, use components of the curriculum framework and your YRBS to develop a scope and sequence, and use a curriculum framework as a communi communication tool for your sexual health education programs. With that being said, I am going to turn it over to Tom so he can share some information with you in regards to um, Vermont law. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. It's funny, hearing the CDC statement, they don't, um, no one knows outside of Vermont all these great changes that we're doing here in Vermont, so I got to chuckle when the CDC isn't responsible because they don't know anything about proficiency-based learning yet, so um, it's kind of interesting. But a few months ago, Donna McAllister and Lindsay Simpson recorded a professional learning module about how recent changes in Vermont education laws impacting health education and physical education. I mentioned in the email, uh, encouraged people to take a look at that learning module with their team if they had a chance. And if you, if you did have a chance to see it either this week or when it came out in the fall, if you look on your screen, there's a raise hand button at the top in the black bar. So if you have seen it at some point in the past four months since it's been developed, if you could just raise your hand and then we can get an idea of how many people have seen it, all or part of it. Okay. So Mary Beth, how many do we have? Uh, the, it's still coming in right now. We have about two or three people so far who have said that they are familiar with that module. So if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, I really encourage you to take a look at it. I'm going to be sharing some of the information that's in it, but just parts of it. Uh, they did a really, really great job, um, so I really encourage you to check it out at a later time if you haven't done that yet. Uh, so today I'm sharing um, this information about curriculum requirements that are part of EQS, the Education Quality Standards. So this all starts back, uh, it started with Act 77 which was passed in 2013, and that's really changing the way schools operate in Vermont. So the legislation of Act 77 drove Vermont State Board of Education to revise education regulations, which they're calling EQS, Education Quality Standards, 
which came out in April of 2014. And EQS is more focused on education outputs and outcomes rather than inputs. And EQS also sets the expectation that Vermont schools shift to the demonstration of proficiency in the educational experience so that graduates are better prepared to be successful in college, careers, and citizenship. And EQS drives all education system work to be led and coordinated at the district and supervisory union level. So we actually have a little poll here. So we're going to ask people to participate. How has EQS impacted your work and the work of your colleagues at your SD or SU? If you're with a team, have a brief discussion of how you're going to vote on it. Your choices are EQ what, and then minimal, moderate, or significant impact on your work so far. So we've got, I think if you vote, everyone can, everyone can see it. So we've got 40% of people are at EQ what? Which um, is interesting. We have about 10 people who have provided their responses. <coughs> Maybe 10 more seconds for everyone to get in their response. And someone, I hear like a TV in the background or something. If someone can mute their phone, that would be great. Or mute their computer. <laughs> All right. So, we've got about 36.4% EQ width, and then moderate is 27. So, all right, this is where we're at. <laughs> so definitely check out that, mod that learning module. It'll really help. Just um, as a reminder, really if you can put your if you can put your phone on mute, there is a lot of background noise. It'd be greatly appreciated. Either star six or push the mute button or turn down the sound on your computers. Thank you so much. It's very much appreciated. Yes, and thank you for voting, everyone who did. That's really interesting. I actually was I'm surprised that so many people don't even know anything about the EQS yet, because it's sort of a it's really everything we're doing is in that little that little document. And that's on the AOE website too. If you haven't seen it yet, I Strongly recommend downloading it and printing it and keeping it on your desk at all times. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the highlights of EQS, which um, you can learn more about in the learning module. But, uh, so I'm going to just read this because uh, we're talking about curriculum today, and this is what's in the EQS around curriculum. Each SU board shall ensure the written and delivered curriculum within the SU is aligned with the standards approved by the State Board of Ed. Each school shall enable students to engage annually in rigorous, relevant, and comprehensive learning opportunities that allows them to demonstrate proficiency in, and we just I cut out the ones that are relevant, um, physical education and health education, and transferable skills. And then that's that E and G, the A, B, C, and D, and F are things like sciences, mathematics, social sciences, the arts, et cetera. So please note that in May 2015, the Vermont State Board of Ed adopted the National Health Education Standards for Health Education. So these standards should be used by uh, SUs and SDs to identify proficiency-based graduation requirements. And we'll talk about proficiency-based graduation requirements in a little bit. The inclusion of transferable skills here indicates the expectation that all content areas will address these skills, such as informed and integrative thinker, creative and practical problem solving, responsible and involved citizenship. Think about the connections between health ed and these transferable skills. Many Vermont schools began this proficiency-based work already by focusing on transferable skills, but people are calling them lots of different things, um, not just transferable skills. One challenge that may um, pop into your head is the word annually, because that's in the EQS, which is the law. 
To address this issue, some districts are implementing health education work during teacher advisories in the, in the upper grades. Uh, other districts are offering a senior seminar that reinforces information and skills learned in health classes, which are usually taken in ninth or 10th grade, and then that's it. So districts have to figure out some way to provide this information annually. That's that piece. The next piece is flexible pathways. Schools must provide students the opportunity to experience learning through flexible and multiple pathways, including but not limited to career technical education, virtual learning, work-based learning, service learning, dual enrollment, and early college. Learning must occur under the supervision of an appropriately licensed educator, and learning expectations must be aligned with state expectations and standards. Many Vermont students are already involved with flexible pathways to graduation. Currently, thousands of students are in the dual enrollment and or early college programs that we have going here. We often hear questions about licensure regarding flexible pathways, but each U.S. clearly states that student learning must occur under the supervision of an appropriate, appropriately licensed educator and must be aligned with state standards. So you may have a situation where a student actually isn't in your health class, but as the health teacher in your district, somehow this, this student will be on a flexible pathway, so you'll have to come up uh, with some sort of plan to help this kid be proficient in health education. And so when we talk later, Mary Beth is going to talk about curriculum planning, keep that in mind, because, not, because of flexible pathways, not all students will be in your classes all the time. To determine if a student is proficient, each SU and SD must develop a local assessment system. And the local assessment system is described in detail in EQS section 2123.2. The next slide is some of the requirements for local assessment system. All right, here we go. Oh, we have another poll. So actually, all right, go ahead. So do you, do, does your district have a local comprehensive assessment system? These are your choices. I don't know. We don't have an LAS with health anyway or we have one, but it's not updated, or we have one and we've realigned it with the National Health Education Standards. We do not have one that helps, that includes health. We are about yeah. to have one beginning next year. Is there supposed to be answers? Yes, we know Susan, I think there's supposed to be answers. And if you want to see the answers, you vote, you can see all the answers. We have about half of you reported, so we'll give it about 10 more seconds. All right, so no one, no one has one apparently. All right, that's okay. And so every district is going to come at this differently, although I do know that districts in Rutland and Bennington counties have sort of all gathered together and they're all going to use the same um, standards and proficiencies so that if students move to another local school in their area, um, that they'll have the same standards, uh, the same proficiency-based graduation requirement in those, I think it's 11 different districts now centered around Rutland County. All right, so actually, go, uh, yeah, this is good. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about HEAP. HEAP refers in, uh, to the Health Education Assessment Project. The HEAP began as a collaborative of states developing health education assessment resources based on the National Health Education Standards. Since 1993, the project was supported by the Council of Chief State School Officers, and access to the resources was limited to member states only. But their sponsorship has ended now, and access is now offered to all interested educators and researchers through the HEAP uh, Health Literacy website. So if you don't have access to HEAP, it's a great resource. Um, you can send me an email, and I can get you the, the sign-on information. It's very simple, and there's lots of good um, assessment information in there and tools. For the past two months, in February and March, small groups of educators have been meeting to develop proficiency scales to help them with their work. By creating proficiency scales, we can identify the depth of knowledge necessary for a student to be proficient in health education or any other topic. We anticipate that this work will produce a bank of samples that can be used as a starting point and can be adapted as needed for use in the proficiency-based classroom. Doesn't that sound fancy? 
So uh, AOE has provided uh, the field with sample proficiency-based graduation requirements, PBGRs is the logo, for each of the content areas. And I mentioned this already, some SUs are adopting the sample PBGRs and this large group in the Rutland and Bennington County area have agreed to adopt the same PG PBGRs. And we'll show an example of a, the PBGRs later in the webinar if you haven't seen it yet. All right, PLPs. Next slide, please. It's PLPs, personalized learning plans. That's also required in the law. Um, it's an EQS. The personalized learning plan shall describe the scope and rigor of learning opportunities and support services necessary for the student to achieve college and career readiness prior to graduation and to attain a high school diploma. So note here that PLPs are also required by the law. Because health education is required for graduation, every PLP must have a health education component, even if the plan states that the student will just take the traditional high school health education course. Curriculum coordination is a critical component to all of these changes. It's very important to note that curriculum content, flexible pathways, and personalized learning plans are all interconnected. We suggest that you organize a group to participate in the learning module if you haven't done so. It's important for everyone involved in student learning in the field to have a good understanding of the entire EQS document. So I, I can't uh, express how great the learning module is. So to summarize a little bit about the modernization that has taken place in Vermont in the past couple of years, Focus is no, is no longer on what the teacher is presenting to the class. The focus is now on using assessment to assure that students are college and career ready when they leave high school. So to support this, each student will have a personalized learning plan that encourages flexibility in achieving proficiency. So that's it. If you have any questions about any of these changes or can't get access to the EQS or can't find the learning module, um, please send me an email. Or you can also ask any questions in the chat box on the left of your screen, and uh, Mary Beth will send those to me. Yeah, so Does anybody Tom, have any questions? Tom, we do have a question from Erica. Um, she works in, um, she's part of a licensed after school program, and her question was how and if these standards laws pertain to them, if you know. Uh, it's really only if they're providing actual education. It's, it's required. It's, it would, but I don't think. I, um, I think that, most of those after school programs. Go ahead. It's she. She doesn't. Hasn't said. Oh yeah. I mean, I think they're all they're, the after school programs have a component of support around education. So it's good that she's here to learn about this stuff because it's really going to impact kids. The class of 2020 is the first class. Um, and they'll be starting ninth grade in the fall, and they're the first class that has to have all this stuff, the flexible pathways, the PLT, the proficiency-based graduation. So they're sort of our guinea pigs. And then uh, another response for Erica was that um, uh, another participant suggested that uh, you check with your school administrator also. The after-school program should check with the school administrator. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if all after-school programs are connected to schools, but maybe they all are. And definitely you can check with Emmanuel too, because he's on top of this stuff. And Emmanuel's our after-school program lead here at the agency. Kurt, if there's no other questions, I'll turn it back to Mary Beth to talk about the curriculum frameworks. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. The conference is now in listen-only mode. Um, Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, definitely appreciate you helping set the stage for Vermont. Um, so as part of the CDC grant that um, the state of Vermont is involved in, uh, one of the activities that the states are asked to help assist their districts with is to um, have them develop curriculum frameworks um, to support the implementation of their sexual health education program. Um, and as Tom has just reviewed this information that is very specific to Vermont and the changes that are being made in 
your education programs, I have definitely worked to try and incorporate and use some of the same language that Vermont is using to help talk about uh, these different curriculum framework components and how to move forward with supporting your sexual health programs. Uh, it might not be a perfect alignment, um, as I am working to address this also from a national perspective. So uh, again, always please ask questions or definitely follow up with Tom afterwards for more clarification of how to really incorporate um, the Vermont um, perspective on this. Uh, so why are we talking about curriculum frameworks and uh, why are they needed? Um, ultimately, a framework is definitely a plan that outlines the specific content and the skills that um, are going to be addressed in your sexual health education programs. Um, they show the correlation between what we want our students to be learning about in their health classes and what, how they can lead to positive health outcomes. Um, for specifically thinking about sexual health education, uh, we want these, the content to uh, definitely support students as they navigate their sexuality and informed decision making. Um, through sexual health education, districts definitely have the opportunity to support students having access to information, um, how to evaluate and utilize information from various resources to help them gain information to achieve overall health and well-being. Um, providing this education helps them comprehend concepts related to their sexual health and to be able to implement realistic plans for lifelong healthy and balanced living. Um, the curriculum framework helps um, provide the, blue, the blueprint for this provision of work. So when we're thinking about um, a curriculum framework, we usually talk about five key areas that we suggest to be um, included um, as part of this document. Um, while you see the five key areas up on the screen, there might be other information that you also think is important to include that could be helpful in communicating about your sexual health program. So by no m means is this the finite list. It's just the, the starting point that um, we recommend or suggest to be included, and I will be sharing an example with you later of a school district's framework that might help give you some ideas of how to organize, plan, and develop one. Um, so this is how we want to move forward with today. Um, you should have received a document in one of the emails that Tom sent out. Um, it was called a Curriculum Framework uh, Components to Support Sexual Health Education. And um, I am going to uh, pull that up right now. I'm sorry about that. Um, it should, you should have received a document that looked like this. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, we are really just going to focus today on sections two, three, and four of those five key areas that I talked about today um, that I listed over in, um, a minute ago on the key components. Um, but this document provides an overview of all five of the areas and sort of what they what they relates to, what they should include, and then we've provided some resources to help you with that, the development of them. As we've already talked about, Tom has really gone over section two, which is the Vermont Education Quality section, Quality Education Quality Standards section. But in the first section, um, which is rationale and intent, this is really the overview of why your district is providing sexual health education, providing the background and the information of sort of setting the stage of what's going on in your state, what's going on in your community that leads you to really ensure that sexual health is being provided. This could include data information that talks about the risk behaviors that your students are engaging in. Um, we'll, we'll talk about YRBS in a little bit. Any community level data, your school climate data, uh, school health profiles. Um, in Section 2, again, it's the, the, the quality standards. So Section 2 is really saying here's, here's what is supporting, here is what we are following. 
um, in regards to ensuring sexual health education is being provided. And again, we've listed some resources to help in terms of what you should be looking at and including so that this information is um, apparent and relevant and you're offering that transparency for those people who are looking at this document. I'm going to skip over sections three and four. Again, we're going to go more in depth into the, more in depth in them um, in this webinar. And then in section five, um, this is the section where you can identify um, materials, curriculum, any additional resources that your school district has approved for use in teaching um, sex ed. Um, Tom and I talked about what resources that the state would like to um, recommend or suggest. Um, and while the state doesn't have an approved list, there are two curriculums that the agency has identified that they would they are promoting and um, supporting in, in your school districts and utilizing. And that is the FLASH curriculum or Family Life and Sexual Health Education and the three R's curriculum, the Rights, Respect, Responsibility. And this is Advocates for Youth um, new K-12 Comprehensive Sex Ed curriculum. Both of these curriculum um, are free. Um, Family Life is free for K through middle school currently, and the um, Rights, Respects, Responsibility is also free, and it's found at these, these websites. So um, we're sharing this document with you again because Section 1 and Section 5 are really about content, about just putting in background information or a listing of resources. Um, section 2, again, is listing of information that is saying what's guiding our programs. Whereas Section 3 and Section 4, there is a little bit of work that needs to be done in order to develop them. And so we're going to really focus on those two areas for the, for the last half of our webinar today. <coughs> And I'm just trying to get myself back to my slide. Okay. And if you, for some reason, did not get that document, um, it will be coming. It will be sent out to you again um, in, oops, in, um, in, in, in follow-up emails from, from Tom. So, section three or component three of a curriculum framework. Um, we're really talking about what we want our young people to know in terms of knowledge and skill development from having received this curriculum or this um, sexual health education program. Um, you know, as you are all familiar with lesson plans and you have your objectives and performance indicators, we want you to be thinking about what is the overall outcome that we want your young people, your students to achieve from receiving this information. Um, and as your committee is working to develop a curriculum framework, this should really be conversations amongst all of you in, in even expressing what you're feeling, also engaging other school level administrators, young people, parents, other um, Department of Health or community members our community health workers or community-based organizations on, you know, what is the greatest outcome that you want for your young people to achieve, and then relaying them to, um, you know, the performance indicators that are identified from the state. And so I wanted to definitely make sure we talk about those a little bit. But if you are in a team right now um, from your district or if you're in a space where you're with other districts or by yourself, I'd really like you just to take a few moments and thinking about the, the health education or the sexual health education that you have been providing for years or just recently. And when you address it, what are you, what are your hopes that your young people will get out of this curriculum? What are the goals that you hope your young people will be able to achieve from receiving this information? So if you could take a minute or two minutes to think about that. And then in the chat box, if you can write down or type in um, some of your thoughts. And so we'll give you a couple minutes to do that to be able to share.
So <clears throat> someone has written um, they want their students to be able to have a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Others have mentioned they would like to see students be able to demonstrate self-respect as evidenced by healthy choices around sexuality. Um, um, another has said they would like their students to, to be able to make informed choices um, regarding all areas of their health with the most up-to-date information available. Respect for self, respect for partners, um, to be able to have healthy relationships, uh, knowledgeable on how to avoid uh, STDs, to be able to prevent, prevent pregnancy, um, to be able to recognize that their choices in the moment impact their future health. So what's going on now and what they, the decisions they make now and how that impacts them in the future. These are all great. So it's really great to see that you're looking at these um, large level ideas, we have more coming in, um, to be able to accept or respect gender differences, um, again, making more informed choices with factual information, um, to be able to have open communication. Again, people want to make sure their young people know how to access accurate information, um, and being able to be comfortable in discussing uh, their sexual health uh, with whomever so that questions can be clarified and answered factually. So these are all really great, you know, large ideas of wanting to ensure that whatever you're providing in terms of education um, and in whatever setting that they're being provided this education, that these are the, this is the information, or this is what you're hoping for your young people. So if you're coming to the table with these ideas, it's really important for you then to look at what um, the proficiency excuse me, performance indicators from Vermont is and being able to make those connections of what, what you're hoping this program will provide um, and what the performance indicators are saying. And really making sure that you, when you're writing your curriculum framework, really being able to clearly indicate what the hoped for goals are is really important because that can continue to keep you focused on, you know, when you're working to select your curriculum, ensuring that what, what the goals are for um, your young people that your communi committees have identified are also going to be addressed in, um, in the curriculums that you're going to choose, um, in the resources or the materials that you might have selected to also support um, the education that's being provided in the classroom. So once you've, you've identified your performance indicators, again, looking back at what Vermont has provided in, in the health education component of um, the um, education quality standards, you, you're ready to start thinking about your scope and sequence. Um, I'm pretty sure, as edu many of you are educators in the, in, in the room, on the call, that you are familiar with scope and sequences. Um, and while they might look, a, they might all contain similar but different information, the, the point of them is ultimately the same. It's to help provide a visual um, to identify what is being taught knowledge-wise and what is being taught skill-wise at, at a variety of grade levels. Some, some people do their scope and sequence by grade level, and others do their scope and sequences by grade band. Um, and when we're thinking about a scope and sequence for sexual health education, we're really looking at what is the knowledge and the skills that a student is going to be able, that a student will achieve or uh, obtain in order to help lower any risks or increase decision making around, you know, avoiding or not becoming infected with HIV, any STDs, um, and are in 
having an unplanned pregnancy. And in addition, you know, ensuring that they have all these additional components that you've talked about from your um, hope for outcomes such as healthy relationships, um, acceptance and respect of others. Um, when thinking about um, Vermont's EQS and having flexible learning pathways and personalized learning plans, this could be a little bit of a challenge of thinking about, you know, how do you sort of create a framework or a structure knowing that you need to be thinking about each individual young person in your class and having these pathways of learning that you might not all be in a classroom. Learning could happen in a variety of places or each person's individualized plan. And so we're making the suggestion that when thinking about a scope and sequence, that you really consider doing your scope and sequences by a grade band or by the end of middle school or by the end of high school so that you have that assessment component, but it's not tied to a specific grade. However, you know that these are all of the different skills and content not um, areas that you would like to address by the end of the time that you have them in, in, in the middle school or at the high school level. Um, the majority of the time scope and sequences are developed prior to choosing a curriculum or selecting a curriculum because they definitely are the blueprint, the, the path to help you identify what is it that I want this curriculum to address at these different grade levels or by the end of this specific grade? Um, but in some instances, some districts do create their scope and sequence after they have chosen a curriculum. They've sort of used a curriculum. They've seen what works, what doesn't work. They've identified that maybe, oh, we need to be talking about HIV earlier than what we thought we needed to be talking about. or we the school district had been addressing, you know, conversations around consent at 11th grade and they're noticing that really those conversations, that content needs to be talked about at an earlier grade. So some people look at the curriculum they've been using and see what has worked, what hasn't worked, where do they see that things need to be changed in terms of when they're actually providing this, and then that helps them develop a scope and sequence. There's no right or wrong. It's really sort of where you're at and what's going to work best for your district. But we do encourage that at some point a scope and sequence does get developed because this, again, provides the documentation, the visual of what is happening in our schools around sex ed, when are things tentatively planned to being getting taught and, and what is being taught so that you can share it more easily with other teachers who might be coming in to, who are health educators to support this curriculum implementation so your school administration knows, that young people know, that the community knows, um, and it really helps alleviate myths or um, ideas that, that what is actually happening is not happening, and this is what is what is actually going on in, in the classroom. So for the, the scope of this conversation, I'm going to be talking about scope and sequence as if we have had no curriculum in place, um, and so this will be talking about development prior to. So when developing a scope and sequence, here are some of the, the steps, um, and these were identified um, through the CDC and some other um, national organizations that have, have, have worked to identify the, some processes. Um, we have made a few alterations in order to uh, address Vermont language and components that are more specific to Vermont. I will be sharing with you, or Tom will be sharing with you after this call, um, a document of a fictitious district and ha them having gone through the development of a scope and sequence because it's, it's, it's so much easier to understand this process when you sort of have an example and you can see it, that it's been done and then you can apply it to your own um, particular situation in your school district. So step one is looking at your guidance. So what do you need to be following? For Vermont, it's your EQS and the National Health Education Standards. Step two, you're definitely going to want to look at your data. Step three, we're going to be talking about healthy behavior outcomes that have been developed from the HECAT or the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool. We're going to, step four is to consider grade levels and instructional time. Step five, thinking about your performance indicators. Step six, looking at other health content um, that you're teaching. 
step seven, prioritizing. What can you actually accomplish? What can you actually cover? Validate with stakeholders is step eight. So sharing this with, with everyone outside of your um, committee and getting buy-in, and then ultimately letting it help you support your curriculum program selection. So with step one, very simply, again, you're looking at your standards, your benchmark requirements. Um, for Vermont, they have adopted the National Health Education Standards. Um, there is also the National Sexuality Education Standards. Um, the National Health Education Standards are general health education content and skills. The National Sexuality Education Standards were um, developed and released in 2012. They were developed off of the health education standards, but they specifically focus on content and skills related to um, eight different uh, categories um, around sexuality. So um, things like identity, personal safety, STDs, HIV, um, reproduction, anatomy, puberty, things like that. So these could be documents that can really, your, do, um, your committee can look at to say, what is, what, what is guiding our practice? What should we be following? What, what can we teach and what do we want to teach? Um, the second step is, you know, while you're looking at these national tools, um, state guidance on, you know, what should be provided to students or what students should be learning, um, you really want to be looking at the priorities of your area. Um, what are the sexual health priorities? Um, and this could be, um, determined by looking at different data tools, um, such as the YRBS. Um, and hopefully you got the email from Tom on uh, being able to access your 2013 YRBS data. Um, hopefully you all were able to access that. If not, um, I'm going to show you uh, where you can find it. Um, the link was provided. and. Uh, it's on your Vermont Department of Health webpage, and there is um, the 2013 reports, and then it lists your county or your school district in which you can look up your, oh, that's the county I, sh I was looking for. You want to look up um, the 2013 local reports, and then they have the reports by supervisory union or school district. Um, and the guidance was provided to find your school district. I'm just going to pull up uh, Milton School District. I don't know if they're on the line or not. If so, welcome. If not, then there's no issue. Um, but your Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a really good place to start in looking at what your young people are reporting about risks that they, risky behaviors that they could be engaging in. Um, section 4 in the high school, so Section 4 is the sexual health related content area. Um, I believe it's, oh I didn't go, um, and these are the questions that are all related to uh, sexual behavior um, or sexual health related questions. So these are the questions that you want to be looking at in terms of I, looking at what are your young people reporting that they're engaging in, you know, ever having had engaged in sexual intercourse or the age at which they engage in sexual intercourse. Um, for the middle school also, we recommend looking at the um, personal safety section also, which are, and high school can look at those also. Um, and those are related to like, safety in the school, bullying. Um, you know, as part of sexual health education, we think about you know, you know, being able to communicate, being safe in a relationship, and it, or or bullying. Um, and so we look at those two areas. So these are two components that you could look at to help support this conversation in regards to um, what content you would want to ensure that. Um, is being taught, and then skills related to that uh, to those contents to be taught also. Um, I'm just going to give people a few minutes. Um, again, the website you should have received a link from Tom. It's the 2013 uh, data, and you can look up your school district. Um, I just want to give people a few minutes if they have theirs with them to be able to look at their data. And maybe this could be the first time you've looked at it to really take, an, take a sense of 
hmm, I didn't realize that these rates were what they were, um, or this is information that helps support the reasonings why we're providing sex, sexual health education in our schools, um, and also what content area or skills do I think we need to be focusing on based on this data. So if you just want to take a few minutes, um, and then if you are able, um, just put in the chat box um, some information that you're thinking about you want to make sure uh, your curriculum or your scope and sequence is going to be addressing because of the data that you've looked at. So for those of you who have been able to look at your data, is there anything that stands out to you, that surprises you, that you want to make sure is addressed in your scope and sequence and future down the line curriculum? Or knowing that you have your YRBS data re, uh, available to you, what are some other uh, data tools that you would think you would want to look at in order to gain more information about what's going on in your community and with your, with your adolescent population. So one person has said, using the YRBS, it is clear that Milton has students who are sexually active but do not have safe sex or um, maybe that means engaging in sexual activity with the use of some type of contraception. Instruction on condom use is a priority. So that would be important to put in your scope and sequence on maybe learning the steps or identifying, being able to utilize steps to effectively use a condom would be something you could use as content and skill development in your scope and sequence. Another person who has looked at their data is saying they're surprised at the amount of bullying that is still going on. So this might be something that uh, this school district could look into um, respect and um, engaging in healthy relationships or communication um, or even how to seek help. Again, another person says students are not using condoms according to their YRBS. So this could be an area of looking at what type of contraceptive education um, should be provided and what skills and knowledge they want to make sure is addressed around use of condoms in their scope and sequence. Another person has looked at their multiple partner um, question, which is question 4.04. .04. Um, and they've said that the number of the, the multiple partners information is, is very high for their, um, their, their, their district. Um, I think it, you call it union, supervisory union. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, again, this could be talking about if a person is, what skills and knowledge do they need to know about protection if they're engaging with, in sexual activity with more than one person, or even talking about healthy relationships and what that means. Again, we have another person talking about communication, about that could be something to address around skills for 
um, content around learning about birth control. Um, talking to their partner and to ask the questions about knowing one's status. So this could be related to HIV information or learning about HIV and STDs and relationships and communication. So great. So I'm really glad to see that the data, like while it's very much a lot of numbers, it can really help guide um, committees and districts into really thinking about the content and skills that their young people should, you would want your young people and um, to be able to learn about in your classrooms or in your flexible pathways, and then what you could assess them on in terms of ensuring that they um, have gained the content and the skills that you want them to around those subject matters. So, and then the final person says, um, in my district, the number of students identifying as lesbian, gay, and bisexual is higher than the state percentage. So it would be important to develop an inclusive curriculum that talks about all sexual activity, not just heterosexual relationships. Yeah, so again, when you're developing your scope and sequence, you can be including um, content, and content around, um, you know, gender and identity, um, but then also the, the components around skill development, around communication and, then, and respect. Um, but then when looking at your curriculum, yes, wanting to find an inclusive curriculum. And I will say right now the, the number of curriculum out there that are inclusive is, is very minimal. Many of the evidence-based interventions are quite dated. Um, and so this conversation is not really being addressed. Um, I will make note to make sure that I follow up with Tom to provide. There is an um, inclusive curriculum that came out of New Jersey that is specifically on um, HIV STD prevention for LGBT youth. Um, I believe it's called staying, um, being, out, staying safe, being Out, Staying Safe. Um, and the new three R's curriculum from Advocates for Youth is an inclusive curriculum. Um, and then the FLASH curriculum, both of those curriculums that I mentioned earlier, um, the high school curriculum has been updated to be an inclusive curriculum. So again, the number of curriculum that is inclusive is very small. Those three are the ones that I know of that have changed language and have included examples and messaging around inclusivity. Um, but this might take the work of the school staff to look at the curriculum that they're using and, and, and try to adjust those changes within that also. Um, so moving on through the development of a scope and sequence, um, the next thing is, so you've talked about you know, your performance indicators or what you want your young people to get out of this education. And then you've looked at your data, so what is actually going on with your young people to help you get a sense of what you really want to make sure is being covered in, in a curriculum um, and so what content and skills you need to be addressing. Uh, the, next, the next component of um, a scope and sequence development is looking at healthy behavior outcomes. Um, just by a show of hands, um, utilizing the hand option on your screen, as Tom pointed out, it's on the left-hand side. Um, who has ever heard of or is familiar with the HECAT or the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool developed by the CDC in which they have identified um, the sexual health, healthy behavior outcomes, or as we call them, HBOs? So looking at our group, we have about half who, who is familiar with this tool. Um, that's great. So um, again, this is a tool developed by the CDC. Um, you can find it by doing a, a simple Google search of HECAT, H-E-C-A-T, and it will bring um, you to their web page. This tool is really used to help um, school districts analyze a curriculum or an after-school program or a community-based organization to analyze any curriculum related to health. Um, the first component is looking at the curriculum in general, such as does it have 
assessment? Does it have learning objectives? Does it have differentiation of instruction? Does it engage parents? What is the cost? Is it medically accurate? And the last component of the HECAT, it breaks down um, into different modules, and the modules are related to the different different health topics, so tobacco, alcohol, and of course we'll be focusing on the sexual health module, and identified here are the eight healthy behavior outcomes. Um, so establish and maintain healthy relationships, be sexually abstinent, engage in behaviors that prevent or reduce sexually transmitted disease, including HIV, and so forth and so forth. You can see them all. Um, these have been identified that a school district, when they are looking to choose a curriculum, as a committee, you would identify the, the, the healthy behavior outcomes that you want to make sure um, your sexual health education program um, addresses. Uh, I will mention that it is quite challenging, if not impossible, to achieve all of those or reach all of those healthy behavior outcomes if you have very minimal time in which to address sexual health. So when we talk about this and you only have your ninth grade health education graduation requirement, you really have to be thinking about which ones do you really want to address during that time. Um, those curriculum that are K through 12, such as FLASH or such as um, the three R's curriculum, might have a better ability to address more of these than others. Um, but again, looking at these, you would want as a committee to choose the ones that you would hopefully be able to focus on during your sexual health education program. So we do want to do a little poll and um, by yourself or with your team after having read through these eight HBOs, which are the ones that you would want your curriculum um, that you would be selecting to address? Healthy relationships, and you can choose as many as you want or that you would want to address. So if you can take a moment, look through these eight HBOs, which ones, given knowing what you have in terms of time available, um, resources available, which are the ones that you would want to address for your students to have, um, for your curriculum to be addressing for your students to learn about? Looks good. So we'll keep it open about 10 more seconds. Okay, closing it. <coughs> so for all those who responded, all of you are looking to ensure that your scope and sequence is addressing knowledge and skill around healthy relationships. Um, many of you are focusing on um, STDs and HIV prevention, pregnancy prevention. Um, so across the board, um, which is great. You know, I always say that you never just want to choose one, um, and you never just want to choose just to be sexually abstinent. Um, based on laws that we have in Vermont and those, those states and districts who are, focused, who are supported under the CDC cooperative agreement, we do need to be teaching more than just abstinence only. So choosing to be sexually abstinent as part of a larger conversation, as part of a larger curriculum is completely fine, um, but we would definitely want to encourage you to choose more than just HBO2 because that would just mean it's an abstinence only program and um, you your guidance does say to teach more than that. So again, you, you could have chosen many of these, which um, the, the question then remains is, like, how do you fit it all in? Is it possible to fit it all in given what grades you have to be able to teach your sexual health education at, the instructional allotment of time that you have? In many cases, school districts who are choosing an, an evidence-based intervention they are designed to be taught at specific school grades, and they are designed to be taught with 
um, so many lessons in mind. And this could be a challenge if you don't have the amount of time or um, you're choosing a curriculum that is actually a person that happens to choose a curriculum that is not right for their grade level. So um, these are just all things to be considering when you're thinking about your healthy behavior outcomes that you want to address and what is your ability to actually teach um, given constraints. In Vermont's case, again, you have your flexible pathways and personalized learning plans. So this takes into account that you know, this might look completely different across the board depending on how you're able to implement. Um, so for example, a school district might choose, um, they want to do healthy behavior outcome number six, which, and, um, excuse me, healthy behavior outcome number one, which is through healthy relationships, and they want to teach healthy behavior outcome number two, which is to be sexually abstinent, and they're a middle school, and they only have, um, they've outlined that they have the ability to teach three lessons at sixth grade and two lessons at um, eighth grade in their middle school courses, and being able to teach both of those healthy behavior outcomes in both of those grades might not be possible given the lessons that they've developed and the assessments that they need to do. So you might have to choose. You might not be able to do the healthy behavior outcomes at every grade, or, or, but you could do one at one grade and one at the other grade. If you're addressing this as a grade band and you have the ability to just teach you know, at several grades, it might be a little bit easier. Again, this is the time when you have to work with your committee and find out when is it, when are you teaching it, when can it be taught, how much time can you allot to it, and then having to choose which healthy behavior outcomes you will provide or focus on at those different grade levels. Again, you might be able to do a few at one grade, one only at the other grade, and then scaffold it appropriately. Um, again, you're wanting to look then con connecting your healthy behavior outcomes to those performance indicators. Um, you'll want to make sure that they match up. Um, as, as, you, as you know with your performance indicators, you might have several pieces of content and several skills to address, and with the healthy behavior outcomes, they too have several pieces, several content components and several skills to address to achieve those um, healthy behavior outcomes at different grade levels. So there, needs, there will be a lot of conversation around, do we have to decrease what we thought we could do? Can we address all of these at every single grade level, or do we have to pick and choose? Um, this will really be then about prioritizing. Um, you can then also look at different health areas. Um, it's a great time where you can look to see if when you're teaching around maybe you know, food and nutrition or tobacco or cessation or drugs and alcohol, is there skills that are being taught in these other areas that support the sexual health education skills that you want to have taught? And you can sort of say, all right, I will teach those skills in um, these other health areas and focus on other skills that these areas do not cover. So really looking at your larger scope of what your health program looks like to help you say, where can I get these skills in in a different place so I can focus on really sexual health related skills that I can't teach anywhere else. Um, remembering that skills take time, you know, it, it takes a while, so, you know, it might not be the best way in terms of, you know, you're always wanting um, skills to be covered as many times as possible and multiple, like, practice with it. That's not always possible, but how do you do the best fix of sort of like puzzle and piecing it together? Again, then prioritize based on time. What are you actually able to cover? What are you actually um, able to be able to cover? Um, this is a time when you might have to revise what you thought you would be able to do at each grade band. Um, you might have to move things around to make it fit. Um, but 
this is where you have to really focus in on what is the key things that you want your young people to walk away with or be assessed upon in order to reach those um, performance indicators and overarching indicators that you talked about a, a few minutes ago. Finally, once you have your scope put together in some form of either matrix or graph, you definitely want to share it with your stakeholders. You want to get their buy-in. You want to get their feedback on does this make sense to them, explain your process. They might have input to share that might make you know, additional changes come up to the, to the scope and sequence that you hadn't thought about. And once it is in its final state, um, even though you know, revisions happen and as, as you know, things come up, it will change probably, you can then add that to your curriculum framework. Um, again, it's a lot of information. It's a long process, um, but it definitely helps of like organizing your thoughts, thinking about what you want to have occur in your program. It, help you, it will help you choose a curriculum because it's identified the, the behavior outcomes you want to address, the skills that you want to address, the content you want to address, and and where you want to address them according to the grade bands or guidance that you receive from the, from the state on where to provide um, sexual health education. So like I said, I do have an example of this for you that I will um, have Tom share out with you so that you can really see a, a, a district walk through each one of these steps and have these conversations about, I wanted to cover all these health behavior outcomes. That's not really possible. Um, I wanted to cover all these skills here, but I'm going to have to move these over here in this health topic because we have limited time and we, we, we can't do that. So hopefully that will be a helpful uh, tool for you to use. Um, before we go into utilizing um, how to utilize this as a communication tool, I did want to share with you uh, an example of someone um, from Chicago Public Schools, um, their own curriculum framework. They call it a sexual health education toolkit. Again, it's people, people don't always call it a curriculum framework. They call it other things, and in Chicago's case, they call it their toolkit. Um, I just briefly wanted to like show you, you know, as we talked about those five key areas, demonstrate and show you how Chicago has done theirs also. So they um, passed a new policy a few years ago um, that was a comprehensive sex ed curriculum, and they really utilized this tool in order to share all the information um, with their school districts, with their teachers, with their parents, in order to be able to say, this is our program. Um, as you can see, uh, we talked about the background knowledge uh, excuse me, background and introduction. Um, here's where they put, this is, this is how their program started. This is um, the time that, uh, you know, their program has been going on and like the different passing of policies. In the background section, this is where they listed their data information about the, the why that they, they are providing sexual health education. Um, Chicago has extremely high rates of STDs and pregnancy, um, and so there is a strong case for why um, um, they are providing this. And they became very specific about, you know, where are their highest rates of, um, of infection and that's where they did a lot of their targeted work. So again, it's taking information and putting it in a way that it can be easily communicated with people. Um, here, uh, as we move along, it talks, we talked about um, in Section 2, you wanted to put their Vermont information. So Chicago included the highlights for their policy that is guiding their work of why they're providing, of what's to be provided in their schools. Um, and then they also included um, the materials that they were going to use. They included the Illinois standards that also um, is supporting the work that they were doing and that they follow the national sexuality education standards. Again, all this information put into a document that helps communicate of what's going on with their program and why they're doing this. Um, as you move along, again, it includes all the information that the other sections were, were asking. Um, they talk about 
the, the implementation plan, they added things beyond what those five key components were, as I, as I had stated. But they put in here information that that was going to be helping in supporting the program. Um, again, this is a document that we'll share with you um, so that you can get some ideas and examples of how, of how this school district put theirs together. But it does incorporate all the different components that we talked about, so materials that they're going to be able to use. They call it tools and resources. Um, they included the standards that they um, aligned all their work with. Um, and, and within here, there is also their scope and sequence down here that was in their appendices. So they've organized it differently, but all the components that we talked about, they have included in this document. Um, and I think it's a really useful example to help guide other people on this process. So, I sort of shared with you an example of how one district um, utilized their curriculum framework or their toolkit to be a communication tool um, about their program. And so thinking about once you have completed your curriculum framework, um, I really want you to think about like how could you communicate your how can you communicate your program? So who who do you think should see, see the curriculum framework? Um, where do you think you can share it? Um, how can you display it? So just take a few minutes, um, and if you can, put in the chat box, who do you think you would share your curriculum framework um, tool with in order to communicate what's going on about your sex ed in your, in your school or in your school district? So one person has stated that they would um, share um, their curriculum framework at their uh, union-wide meetings. Um, they would share it with um, parents, the school board, school administration, um, put it, bring it to their parent night and display it at parent night, um, have it available during open houses. Um, other people have said present to the school board staff, include, it, include information about it in a parent newsletter, um, share it with your SHAC. I think that's great. You could even engage your SHAC in helping develop the curriculum framework. Um, and someone says it should be available for everyone to see. You could put it on a school website. So, yeah, all great, great examples so that it doesn't become like this tool that like what, what's its purpose? Why did I use it? This is a tool to help communicate effectively about what's going on in your program. When you have different staff coming in and coming out, you can share it with them so that they're not starting from scratch or teaching or providing information that is not in accordance with your school district. It's, it's an educational tool as well. Um, sharing it to the school board so that it's part of the process for, develop, for adopting a health education curriculum. Exactly. So it can be a very powerful document, um, and it can be utilized in a variety of ways, as you've all just said. Um, it's a living document, so putting it up on a news, um, excuse me, putting it up on a website is probably a great idea so that you can change out information as it becomes available. Um, you know, and sharing it with those who really can be, an, can be a supportive partner in ensuring that sexual health education is being provided. Um, it really is also a great myth buster and um, alleviator of fears when parents or caregivers aren't sure of what's going on, but providing them the components of this toolkit to say, here, here is what's happening. Um, developing fact sheets is really also helpful too as part of your toolkit to be able to answer questions that they have. So um, all great ideas. Um, it, it is a process. It does take time to develop. Um, but if you 
sort of look at the five key areas and think about what are the materials and the resources that you already have available to you that you can just sort of quote unquote plop in, such as the Vermont information utilization of your YRBS as data key components, and then looking at what you need to develop and developing an, a, a plan can help move this process along. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to stop for a minute and ask, I, I believe I've answered all questions that came up. Um, there was a question earlier on that if um, the FLASH curriculum or the three R's curriculum um, supported the um, flexible learning pathways or the um, um, in, uh, personalized learning plan. Um, that is a question that I think I'll let Tom field later on um, because I, I'm not completely 100% completely about that. What I can say is in regards to the three R's curriculum is that it is meant to be utilized as the school needs. So it is a K-12 curriculum. It's free online at the Advocates for Youth website, and it's meant to be picked selected from. So if you don't have a curriculum or lesson plans and you're looking for lessons around um, teaching around gender or if you're looking for a lesson plan to really help support you teach about puberty, you can pick and choose those lessons and, and, and utilize them as you want to to help support a curriculum you have or to be the curriculum or the lessons in and of itself. So I feel that it could support the model of um, flexible pathways and um, personal learning plans, but I, I'm not exactly 100%. And for the flash, I, I really can't speak to that completely um, because I'm not 100% familiar with every component of the curriculum. Um, but at the end of the day with that one also, uh, I. It, I think it has the ability to be flexible. However, it wasn't really developed to be like a, a pick and choose lesson. It was to be taught in its entirety. However, I do know that school districts, because it is such a, a utilized curriculum, people do pick and choose from them. Um, I don't know, Tom, if you... The conference had, is no longer in listen-only mode. Tom, if you maybe had anything else you could share, I'm not sure. Can you read the question again? I couldn't hear it. Um, it was, do the three R's curriculum and the FLASH curriculum support or can uh, the uh, learning flexible pathways and the personal learning plan? Yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about flexible pathways and PLTs is that um, as long as all the instruction leads to helping the kids be proficient, um, it, it, can be, it can be helpful. So it's sort of like using a backward design where we're going to have, all the districts are going to have the standards, the proficiency-based graduation requirements, so all the instruction and the work that the students do will be to, to that end of being proficient in health education. So yes. Yeah. Is there any other questions that anyone has? Okay, so if there's no other questions, um, again, Tom is available for you, but, um, and I'll have my contact information available to you also. But um, Tom, um, I know that you had some next steps that you wanted to address with, um, with your school, uh, with the participants online today. Right, so what we're going to try to do is We've been bad about providing um, follow-up support after trainings or webinars or conferences, and so we're going to do better with that moving forward. And so I would like you either with your team or if you're not with your team today, just yourself, identify two next action steps or action items that you're going to work on towards improving the curriculum for sexual health education in your district. So whatever those two things are, um, just you can drop me an email. I think that link works. And I will follow up with you in two to three weeks to see how you're doing and if there's any kind of support I can give you around any of that work. 
I've also put um, Tom's email address in the chat box if you don't have it. So definitely make sure that you email him those items. Um, at the uh, end of this webinar, you are when you close out, you are going to be taken to a SurveyMonkey link to fill out an evaluation. We do hope that you will um, complete that. It's really great to get your feedback for how you, we can improve your experience and what other learning content that you'd, you'd want. Plus, it also gives you an opportunity to reiterate what those action steps that you might, might do. Um, in addition, uh, you will be getting an email from me and Tom later on, I would say within the next week or so, with information on how to um, get access to the recording of this webinar um, and all the documents that we shared and um, examples, those will be sent out to you also. And for those of you who are newer to this work or with this uh, team, uh, we've got a Google community where we share a lot of documents like this, so things will be on the Google community, and we will send you an invitation as well so you can access those, uh, those forums and reports and things. So with that being said, um, here is my contact information and Tom's contact information. Uh, definitely happy to help answer questions or provide additional information to support you in um, developing curriculum frameworks, questions that you might have about different curricula that we talked about today, or more resources. Um, but we definitely thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and it's just always very exciting to know all the great work that is, being, that is going on amongst all the different states to support uh, sexual health education for our young people. And so I applaud you and I thank you for doing the work that you do. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, so again, thank you so much for attending today. And have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Please do the survey.